Well, hey everyone, welcome to episode 363 of F Stop, Collaborate and Listen with your host, Matt Payne. This week on the podcast, I had a great conversation with Kent Burkhardsmeyer. Kent was introduced to me by former guest Tim Chapman, and as soon as I discovered his approach to making photography, I knew that he would be a great fit for the podcast. Kent and I share a lot of common beliefs relating to nature's power for healing, and so our conversation was easy and enjoyable. I'm going to spare you my Patreon spiel today, and just thank you all for your support of the show. Thank you. Okay, let's get to this week's episode with Kent Burkhardsmeyer. All right, Kent Burkhardsmeyer, it's great to have you on the podcast. Thank you. It's great to be on. Thanks. Yeah, of course. I was really excited when our mutual friend, Tim Chapman, who was on the podcast several years ago, reached out to me and he said, Hey, I have this friend named Kent that you should totally have on your show. And the more I got looking into you and what you do, I was like, yeah, that sounds perfect. So here we are. All right. Yeah, I was very, Tim's a great friend. We met uh, about 2019. We met in China on a workshop together. And then last year, we uh, went to Bolivia and Chile together to photograph the Salarda Uni. So oh, wow. got to spend a lot of a lot of times, three weeks basically together. So on that on both trips, so so it's fun. He's a super good guy, great photographer. Yeah, and if people haven't listened to that episode, he has a gigantic camera collection of cameras that have gone to space, which is super cool. Yeah, yeah, and you can go down a whole other avenue with him on that conversation. Oh my gosh, he knows all about it. So. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Well, for people who aren't familiar with you and your photography, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, so I'm a full-time photographer, do landscape, nature. I've been doing that since, uh, I'd say officially since 2015. Um, prior to that, I was in the corporate world for like 30 years in IT. And I live in, well, where I live is an interesting conversation because I live full time in an RV, um, but I'm domiciled in South Florida outside of Fort Lauderdale, where I've lived since 2001. And the RV is sitting in San Diego right now. We'll go back to it in March and then we'll be back on the road. So my wife and I have been doing this. This will be our fourth. We'll be starting our fourth year in April and travel around North America, uh, basically to do photography, get out in nature, etc. I have two adult kids. The one lives in Seattle, one lives in Atlanta. We have no pets, so we're just pretty uh, flexible on that. And yeah, that's kind of what I do um, full time, but as landscape photographer. And now I, now I also consider myself, I, I say I'm a photographic artist and a poetic writer. I started doing some poetic writing during the pandemic and continue that, but I like to kind of do more artistic, or I like to think things more artistically than just um, straight, straight camera shots. Got it. Well, man, so real quick, the RV stuff. So you go back to San Diego in springtime. Do you have like a set journey that you do or is it different every year? How does that work? First year we started 2021 it was everybody's out there so we there's some great apps you can plot things so we started late and we were just plotting and we had some set places to go to so we uh, we bought the place site the the camper site on scene out of san diego and we're in fort lauderdale so we sold our condo we packed up stuff in a storage we rented a cruise america and a u-haul we zipped across in six days from fort lauderdale to san diego picked up our RV and truck. We bought it combined. It's a fifth wheel, it's 40 feet. So we're really towing, towing a house. And then we started uh, plotting out and I had to get to a class reunion that got delayed. Uh, I grew up in North Dakota. So we headed up to Bismarck, North Dakota. And gosh, we were doing in 30 days, 25, 30 days, we went from San Diego to North Dakota and we were stopping like every for two or three days, uh, a lot of setup and shut down and a lot of miles, and, but it was all learning experience for us. And then we started replotting and we kind of zigzagged around, crisscrossed mostly Western United States that year, ended up 
Oh, no, we actually came all the way back to Fort Lauderdale and January parked the RV in a cover place for four months, rented a, a place here for four months, snowbird, I guess, for the first time, we'd say. And then, and then we went up the East Coast. And so we would plot where we were going in this app. It would tell us, it would help direct us so we didn't go under bridges that were shorter than our RV because oh, we yeah. need 13 and a half feet. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so a lot of things we learned about that. Um, then we went up into Canada, went across Canada, came back to the West Coast, went down to San Diego, parked it there, flew this time to Fort Lauderdale, rented a place, then flew back and then decided we liked Canada so much. So last summer we went, and late spring, we went up to Vancouver Island and then we went west, or went from the west to the east until we got to uh, the plains of plains of Canada, we dropped back into North Dakota, and there was a lot of fires in Quebec and a lot of floods in Vermont. So we decided to turn around and go back to the west. We parked a month in um, Montana and Kalispell area, and then we decided, oh, let's start looking for houses. So we looked last fall for houses in Kalispell, Missoula. Didn't find anything we liked. So we said, drove back to San Diego with the RV. And now we're, when we go back in March, we're going to go back up to Missoula and park for two months and look for a house and see if we can find something in Montana. Nice. So, that's, that's quite the adventure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we're uh, a little bit, we're, we're a little less prepared this time. I just plotted uh, last week, the trip from San Diego to, to Missoula. We like to spend minimum four days at a site, and if and if there's something from a photographic perspective in the area, then we'll stay longer, so we can explore, do some scouting, um, mm -hmm. check on the weather, and hopefully get some good, interesting things. So, sounds like quite the lifestyle. I'm I'm a little bit jealous. <laughs> <laughs> it's a committed life. It's a committed uh, to be kind of uh, flexible. Handyman, comfortable in small spaces, especially if you're traveling with somebody else, and and love outdoors because and that's the key. We're we're outdoors every day. We grill all the time outside. We'll sit out and have a fire when when there's no bands, and um, and then we're out hiking and exploring. So that part is great. Yeah. Well, let's dive into some photography. Uh... First of all, how did you even get into photography to begin with? I was like most people, well, a lot of people. I started off in high school as a yearbook, uh, sports photographer in yearbook. Uh, another classmate and I did all the sports. And then but that was back in the eight, uh, late 70s. And then we just, I just had a camera all the time. But I would not say I was a photographer then. I was just, I had a SLR, I had a Canon AE-1 and some lenses, but... I didn't really know what I was doing or I was just taking pictures and I liked it. And I'd say the real jump into photography was when my son was in uh, soccer for 10 years, I was photographing, he was travel soccer. So we had games like four days a week. I was taking pictures. I was doing the 10,000 clicks a year and uh, a lot of camera, a lot of, a lot of camera in front of me, uh, many hours. And it was year around basically. And then, I would probably say 2011, I started really kind of researching, studying, self, self-taught, um, learning the craft better, learning uh, cameras, learning settings and ideas. And then in 2015, I joined up with some places here in South Florida. There's a photo group called um, Palm Beach Photographic Center, and they do an annual thing called Photo Fusion every January. So I used to do that and learn from people, do some outdoor workshops. And then I met a group of people in a adult art community here that there's about 10 of us are all photographers and we just started helping each other out. And that's when I decided I needed to think something different about corporate America. And I really liked photography. So we I decided I would self-impose the sabbatical, try it for 
it was going to be one year, but I thought I better ha I better plan for two years, better save for two years, so that in case, or not in case, I actually thought I was going to go back into the corporate world, mm -hmm. um, that it would take me a year to get in. And then 2015, enjoyed it, and just, I've been doing it ever since full time. I never went back to the corporate world, and I realized it's landscape. I tried street photography. I knew I did not want to do portraiture or weddings or um, sort of the commercial photography. I knew I did not want to do that. I'd always been an outdoors person. So that was what really led me to it. And I learned the possibilities from this group of photographers because we had a mixture of abstract photographers, portrait photographers, street photographers, some landscape, black and white, um, color, some composite artist and I just started seeing what could be done and they helped me along this journey. So. Nice. Well, we'll definitely dive deeper into the corporate transition mm -hmm. uh, for a bonus episode for our Patreon supporters later on. And we'll talk more later as well about uh, this idea of collaborating with other um, photographers on projects and things of that nature. But I have a few other questions I wanted to dive into before we went there. Sure. So when we had first corresponded, you had mentioned that you've lived in a lot of different places all over the planet um, for your job. And I was curious um, if you could speak about all of those places that you've lived and how living in such diverse areas has contributed to you as an artist. Uh, yeah, I thought that was a great, that's a great question. And I didn't put a lot of thought into it, but in reality, it really has because uh, A, a, it helps with travel, so being willing and interested in seeing things in other places. I know some some people like to focus on their backyard, and, if you will, their neighborhood, and really learn that extremely well. And I have aspirations of doing that. I've visited places again and that multiple times. But I, I think from having lived overseas in, I think, five countries, it's opened my eyes to... Ex, be ex, more exploratory in seeing different different areas and and also different cultures, different people. Like I mentioned early on about going last year to Bolivia with Tim Chapman, so that might have made me scared ten year or before I ever lived overseas. I might have been very nervous about doing that and and cautious, maybe reluctant to do that. Um, but now having lived and worked overseas, it excited me. It's like, oh, there's nothing. I, I've been through scenarios where I go into a place where you don't know the country, you don't know the language, you don't know the culture, and I survived. So, so that has helped from the exploration part. And then being willing to see things with different eye sets than as a say a traditional american i knew no i knew one language and that was english and probably some would say i didn't know that very well but <laughs> being able to just kind of look at communities whether i'm traveling different small rural communities in north america or large urban areas i'm um, going to other countries and photograph there trying to see things maybe from their perspective and um, the local perspective, as opposed to a tourist perspective. And that was, so that I think hopefully is reflected in some of my images and that where I like to find the ordinary out of the extraordinary in a way. I mean, I'll do the sort of grand landscapes, et cetera, or the intimate ones. But sometimes I, I will find like, especially when we're RVing, I'll find an area that it's not, you know, it's not a sweet spot everybody's gone to in that, but I find the beauty there and I hone in on photographing that and what really touches my eyes and heart. So, so I think that's probably been a huge influence to me. I love that. Well, well I, will, I really want to dive deep into one of the main topics for our conversation. So you have two books. You sent them both over to me. Thank you so much for doing that. One is called uh, Stillness, the other is called Awareness, and they're in a series of books that you call Whispers from Nature, and they were both released at the same time. I was curious if you could um, talk a little bit about how those books came to be and what you hope to accomplish by publishing them. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, 
I have a feeling most most of us photographers like to have a photo book. We'd like to print something and sort of maybe it's our little legacy. Um, and I was thinking about that and I've seen quite a few and uh, but every a lot of people do that, a lot of photographers. So what could I be? How would I be different other than my images and maybe the format or style? But they're, you know, they're in all shapes and forms and sizes, etc. So I didn't know. I just put it on hold. I knew I wanted to do one at one time. During the pandemic, though, I had a lot of trips that got canceled in 2020. Like I was going to go to Spain and then we were going to go to England. Um, we had some ideas we wanted to, my wife and I wanted to do photographically and tour wise, and it just all got shut down. So I was getting steer crazy, little depressed, I would probably say. And I had been reading a lot about meditation. I was using meditation to help get through the emotions of everything around the pandemic. And each morning, I, my routine would be I'd get up, get my coffee, I'd sit down and I'd read some books or start doing some breathing and do meditating. And I started thinking of the images, places I'd been, pictures I'd taken, and I would go grab, I'd go look them up on my computer then, and words would just start flowing of what I was feeling or what the images were, what I'd call whispering to me is the, the term I'm using. So I started jotting them down. And at that time I was posting the image and I'd post, uh, I don't know if I'd call them poems, I'd call them um, poetic writings, but they'd be short stanzas and I'd post them on Instagram because you had only small space to do it. And, <laughs> and I was getting feedback from, from followers that were saying, oh, these are great. These are so helpful. I can relate to you. Um, keep doing, I'm glad you're doing it. So I felt like I was contributing to others like me that were struggling through the pandemic and shut in. And then several people said, oh, you, can put, you need to put them as a book and um, I'd like to get one. So that got me thinking about this could be a different way to do a, a photography book. And now I call it a photo poem book. So the layout is one side will have an image and the other side will have the poems that go with it. And it's truly a meditative experience. And I wanted them to be easily seen and read at one sitting um, and a lot of white space in it and just have an opportunity, what I say, invite nature inside. So invite nature inside your house, in your home, in your heart, etc. So I wrote, started writing them, and I'd been doing the research before about photo books, so I kind of knew the thickness I wanted to have, and I thought, okay, this would be a good way. So I, I, this was um, March and April and May of 2020, and I just said, okay, I'm going to stop at the end of May, and I'll put together a book. And I had enough... To, and I knew the size, so I had enough to do two books. And so I found a, a printer, a printing house uh, in Canada. And I knew I did not want to do a digital on demand printing. And so I wanted to do the traditional printing methodology. I decided to self publish, I designed it, I learned a uh, finishing publisher and did everything, kind of put it all together, got a great team at Friesen was the name of the printing house. And so we did the one book that that's actually sold almost almost all of the limited editions. I did two versions, a limited edition, a little bit more upscale and then um, a traditional, just a regular one. And it sold most most of it sold out. There's a few left on the on the regular one and I'm holding some limited edition ones because I'll eventually do a collection of all of them and and sell those together. And then mm -hmm. so then I did the second book the next year and it kept and now I've been continuing to write. So now now I basically for the most part aren't posting images unless I put a, a poem with it or have one written down and I might just put a, a subset of it on whether it's Instagram or Vero is the other, the other platform I'm using. 
and I've been collecting them. So I have quite a few material for probably definitely one book, maybe two books. And I <laughs> use Whispers from Nature as the series. So I have some ideas of the titles for the next one. And I wait until I get a house, I think, because it actually is a lot of a lot of sit down work and and that to and stuff spread all over the place. So it probably won't be until 2025. Yeah, I mean, self publishing is you have to have storage space, you have to have, you know, a workspace to actually like ship stuff out. I mean, it's it's a pretty involved process if you've never done it before. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And now being in I have an RV. Uh, all my boxes of books, I had to, I found a distribution place, so I had to ship them to them so they can oh. ship them out when they get ordered and shipping, shipping after the pandemic became very expensive. So, uh, it was, it was a lesson learned on that one, but yeah. I might have to pick your brain later about distribution because that's a challenge that I have with the books that we do for our competition that we run every year. So yeah, it's... Yeah. Like when the pallets show up at my door and there's a thousand, you know, well, in my case, it's more like 600 books, but whatever, you know, it's like, okay, <laughs> I know what I'm doing for the next week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we can ch definitely chat. I know of two different companies I research and they're not super expensive and you can have them shipped directly to them. Not... That's cool. I like that idea a lot. So. <laughs> And it probably, to some degree, is a wash in terms of your time and materials costs and things like that. So Exactly. Right. Yeah, because they'll do the packaging, the labeling. You just have to integrate to their system the order form. So that that helped a lot. And I will actually use that method on the next books. I'll have rather than all the books getting shipped to me and then me shipping them to the distribution center, I'll ship it, have it shipped directly to them. And then uh, that cuts out a double a double shipment cost. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and cool, every so... little bit counts when you self-publish, right? Because it's it's nickels and dimes. You don't you don't make a living off of publishing books these days. Not but... easily. <laughs> That's for sure. Well, so in your books, you're combining poetry or, like you say, poetic writing with your photographs. I would love for you to talk a little bit about how that particular approach of combining photos with poems has helped you find clarity and helped you kind of cope with the world that you found yourself in through the pandemic. The best way it is does is it makes me look into nature deeper, I'll say. Kind of, kind of it's uh, guru-ish, I guess, but... Uh, it's really nature has so much to offer us and teach us and has stored wisdom. And we overlook it when we live in urban places and if we don't go out. And so especially now when I my, I would say my my work process when I go out photographing is um, spend a few moments just being present and just calming down and that and digital we want to just click 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 type of a thing and so mm -hmm. um, I actually have taken up retaken up film photography to try to slow me down but I still use the crutch of my digital but it has has helped me slow down so I just like to go into nature and look around not only for what I want to capture and how I want to uh, compose my image and that but it's like just feel Feel what's what's there. Feel what how I feel and how I'm relating and what's kind of troubling me at the moment or what I'm excited about. It doesn't have to be all down and go like, oh, I can be jubilant about something and then I see this glorious sunrise or something. Like uh, I went over to the Badlands of South National Park in South Dakota last summer and there's like this amazing sunrise coming up over the pinnacles of the Badlands and it's just like just speaking to me like a uh, symphony was. And so I created a poem called Crescendo based on that one. And it was just capturing all that. And it's just, it was in awe and in thanksgiving and in gratitude. Um, so they will happen. Thoughts will come to my mind. I'll try to capture them in a book uh, afterwards or sometimes do a recording on my phone. But usually I'll come back with the photo and I'll actually, as I'm, uploading them and curating and then 
doing some preliminary processing to see potential, that's when I sort of start formulating a little bit more what's kind of speaking to me. What what a what am I feeling in it? What's now I'm kind of focusing on what's the essence of of that moment and what was the essence of that of that image I captured or the series of images and how can I put that into some writing, whether it's a little haiku or a variant of a haiku or a longer multi stanza poem. And then it'll be, it usually relates to what I'm feeling comes out so as well. I, lo- I love that. And I was curious, when you're coming up with the words that uh, go with the actual photograph, um, it, it sounds like sometimes it comes to you right away, like in the moment of capture, and you're like, oh, I have to say it into my phone or write it down really fast. But it also sounds like sometimes... It comes to you later as you're processing the images. What's the split there in terms of things coming to you right away versus later on in the process? Great question. Gosh, I my my first instinct says it's probably more seventy percent is post. Mm-hmm. Um, but then as I as I'm kind of going through it and putting down words and capturing it, it's memories and triggers from the experience are coming back and coming out. So they were there, I believe. And uh, maybe I didn't take enough time to really be in the moment there. And now I'm reliving the moment and being in this moment with it. And it's kind of formulating or I know there are some cases where a certain word will come in and it'll be sort of a a topic or the main component that I'm feeling and that will still be there. And then it's just uh, what goes around it um, and how do I weave that into it? Like, for example, we were in Glacier National Park last fall and it was it was an amazing fall. I, I don't know if in Colorado you had as amazing one, but they had had a lot of good winter and rain and spring rain and summer rain. And then the fall was just glorious. And so there were these reflections on the water flowing out of the river that flows through the Glacier National Park and the reflections were just stunning and so I, I, I just sat there for probably an hour and a half taking pictures and looking back at them later there was one that uh, as I was processing the conflicts in Europe and Middle East were happening and so the colors were falling off the edge of the image and so i was i was thinking a lot about the fallen soldiers and the fallen people that have been dying in that and so and then it was fall time and so i ended up writing a poem called fallen uh, based on this picture that was helping me um through that and and think through it as well as how i felt this image what the image was speaking to me so that's <clears throat> that's powerful it's I think it's pretty incredible that you're able to use the photography combined with the writing as a mechanism for processing what's going on in your life or what's happening in the world. And I'm guessing that that combination also helps you form a more personal relationship with the, with the work that you're producing. Yeah, it does. It does. I mean, I think we all as, photographers all of our images are our children if you will and and people always what's your favorite and it's like well how do you how do you decide which one but um they do they have more they're more connected to me i guess now because there's it's a multi-facet um artistry i think and so i see it from both sides i i do feel like remember remember and a lot more from the image side, the the poems, I don't I don't uh, memorize them. They're I kind of go through them, and then sometimes when I revisit. I have some different thoughts, and if I've reposted afterwards on some of them, I might do some revisions on it, and maybe a little cleanup. Or it usually doesn't change the meaning or the subject and how it was dealing with, but it's more. A better word, I think, it would could have been expressed here, or I could break it out a little bit different. But um, I do like going back and looking at them, 
we were, I don't remember what it was recently, we were kind of hunkered down for a little bit and I was actually uh, revisiting even my books. I was revisiting back to them and reading through them. I'm like, oh, it's so relevant today to me as it was three years ago. I really needed to hear that message again. Like, uh, and so <laughs> I would read through it and look at the image and it was still talking to me. So that was a good thing. And I feel like your work is a good example of something I try to teach students. If you focus on making the images for yourself and making it more about a process for you to relate to nature or relate to the subject that you're capturing and you don't worry about external validation or you don't worry about what other people are going to think about the image when you capture it, when that connection happens, eventually your audience will gravitate to it and they will uh, appreciate it and it will provide meaning to them and they will find things about your photography and about your work that uh, is of benefit to them. Um, and it sounds like that's something that you've experienced uh, through, through your photography. Yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. And that's my definitely my experience. Like I've done, I've done workshops with other photographers and I find that if I, usually in those workshops, I might gravitate to what a photographer's approach and style is, and I'd want to try it. It ends up being, I don't get any decent pictures that I feel good about, especially if I try to mimic somebody. I was just like, oh, there's crap. And then I have to walk <laughs> away, and I have to go, go take maybe what I learned and use some, it might help me think a little differently, but then I go back to what works for me, and I find oh, these are, these images are really good. Yeah, I've done that several times on workshops where I've been at a site, thought this is an awesome place, three, four days with the other photographers and that, and there was nothing. I, I couldn't, I wasn't comfortable with anything, but then I go back and then I, or I stay longer and I'm on my own. And I like, oh, how did I miss that? I was right there. Oh <laughs> gosh, this is amazing. It's because then I was, I was doing it for me and my way and and letting my letting my heart drive the photography as opposed to my brain trying to drive it and you know people will talk about being in the flow and then I, I felt I was in the flow that versus I'm just trying to regurgitate what somebody else's flow is and that that doesn't work yeah for sure I mean relating to workshops I think the best thing you can do as a participant is to try to incorporate the things you're learning from the workshop leader into your own personal workflow later on. So yeah. I think a lot of people go into workshops with the mindset that they're going to get all these amazing photographs on the workshop, which can happen for sure, right? But yeah. like the real benefit is to take bits and pieces of what you learn and incorporate it into your own toolbox. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And feel comfortable that... <clears throat> your then getting to a confident level that you can be your own workshop <laughs> so you can you you can i mean that i don't want to discourage from people going to workshops and that because uh you you get to meet some other great artists you get to be some great locations you get to understand how other people and you can process that for yourselves but uh it's really i believe it's really about what what I'm drawn to and what I see and what I feel. And those are the ones that I take extra interest into when I'm working on them and processing them and uh, sharing them with others. And others will see it, as you were mentioning earlier, as others will see those images that you really, your eyes light up when you share them with them or they can just feel it in the image that, oh, Matt and Kent, they really got into this one. This really touched them, that image, so. Yeah, that's great. Well, maybe you could talk a little bit about the upcoming gallery exhibition that you have um, that's gonna showcase your photography and your and your poetry. Thanks. Uh, so this will be my first solo exhibition. It's gonna be in uh, Bismarck, North Dakota, where I grew up. I had done a gallery show there 2019, a joint one with uh, Abstract Painter, and we can talk about that later. Um, but this show is 
going to be May 1st through June 28th, and it's called the Capitol Gallery in Bismarck, North Dakota. The title of the show is Invite Nature Inside with Whispers. So I, I refer to whispers as the poetry part, and then um, the imagery are the whis the whole the combinations kind of whispers from nature. But I, I believe that, and I've studied quite a bit about the impact that nature has on us from a well-beingness. And so if we can invite nature into our homes, our offices, our hearts, uh, our friendships, our relationships, etc., it helps our well-being. And there's studies that show even if you can't get out to nature by hanging and buying a, a nature photography or an art piece of nature, that works as well. So um, you can do it sort of by osmosis or uh, as a surrogate. So this show is going to have, I'm still working on the actual numbers. It's probably between 25 to 35 images will fit in. It's a, it's a decent sized gallery and I'll probably be do two images, for, probably for every three image, there'll be a poem. So not every image is gonna have a poem with it. Similar to the book, there'll be an image and then there'll be a poem by it. And then there'll be some space and that to hang those. The books will be there, some pieces. I'm co-collaborating on with some other artists to have some pieces in there. We have some different ideas on that as well. Yeah, and then I want to, I have some aspirational, so it's about how can I do it? I, because it's a, with nature, I want to sort of set up little vignette rooms, if you will, and I want to have a tree in there, like indoor trees, um, maybe some maybe some orchids around some haiku, and I'd love to have a big boulder. My son suggested maybe finding one made out of styrofoam or something instead of like some two-ton <laughs> boulder rolling in. Uh, water system or something, but so the aspirational to have bringing more nature inside. Uh, so we'll see how I pull that off. So <laughs> that's fun. Yeah, I'm curious when you first learned about this, all of the positive impacts that nature can have on us. I think, I mean, it was fairly evident to me just through my own personal experiences in nature. But the first time I actually made the connection on a scientific basis was. Um, in a Hidden Brain podcast I listened to where they had a researcher come on and they talked about all of this research they did with exposing people to spending more time in forests, actually. And they actually tested, you know, their cortisol levels and their their blood pressure. And they basically, like, they, they tested yeah. their blood for the presence of things that fight off infections and things like that as well. Yep. And what they yep. found was like the people that spent time in nature, all of those things are improved. And it's not just like the day after it's it like lasts for weeks at a time. And then like you said, what I thought was even more interesting is that if you're just shown pictures of nature, that it actually has the same exact benefit. I mean, it's not as exactly. much, but it does, right. it is the same. I actually wrote a whole article about it on my website, but I'm curious, when did you first learn about some of those connections? I'm trying to think the first, I think it was similar kind of a deal, but it was a book I was reading. Somebody had recommended, I, I believe the book that I first started on was called The Nature Fix. Mm. And um, it, in that, it's, a, it's like 10 or 12 chapters, and they look at nature from a different pieces of impact. And it was a writer, she was a journalist, or she's former journalist, I think, in the East Coast. And so I read that book and I got really fascinated. And one of the sections was forest bathing. And, but they had all the research. So then I got excited about that. So I started reading, um, it's Dr. Kui Ling, I think is the doctor, the Japanese doctor that was doing all the research. So it's going down the same path as you were. And then I started uh, going to the next book and another book and some other research on it to just feel, to see what are the benefits. And I, I totally bought into it. I agree with it. I know when I'm out walking, whether it's on a coastal right here or by the coast, if I'm walking along the ocean and the waves are crashing or I'm in a forest or I'm along, even in the plains of North Dakota, I can feel the positive impact it has on my well-being. And so uh, that reiterated. And then there was, yeah, the studies about how you can just have 
an art piece up of nature and it does the same effect and um, doctors and patients will do better in hospital rooms when they are looking they have a window or they have some nature that they can project them and then it turns out different colors of nature have different impacts and so I started a series as well on my when I was blogging for a while about the color green and nature and I wrote a post on that I got all the material to write some other colors and other aspects of just I need to get out of an RV to kind of put more time on that. So, excuse, I guess. But yeah, it's it's there, and it's um, I don't know, people realize it, and some people know it. And I think doctors and hospitals are understanding how it helps them, especially pain management. It does a lot with reducing uh, or increasing tolerance or pain, or not not harboring so much on the pain and they they can then recover a little bit faster so that's a, a big positive when you're in northern climates and you don't have the winter sun having nature in your your home and your office helps with your mood and and outlook and stuff so you can get through that a little bit better so yeah that, that's why i believe inviting nature inside is is key in into our spaces so yeah i'm curious yeah. You know, you're, you're you're equipped with this knowledge about all these positive impacts that nature has on the human body, the mind, our spirit. How do those impacts inform the way that you approach photography and poetry? On the photography side, it, it helps me go to, I think some people use the term quiet landscape or maybe minimalist landscape or yeah, quiet landscape, I think, is a term that kind of connects more with my style. I will try to photograph less, maybe less, uh, I don't know what the right word, I don't want to say noisy or busy, but less energetic or, you know, it's not going to be, I, I would love to photograph a volcano erupting, but it, <laughs> that would, but that would not be kind of a quiet landscape scenario. Right. Um, uh, but things like a waterfall, even though there's a lot of energy in action with water, and that, and that can be a very energetic photo, there's a very calming effect in water and water sounds of water. So photographing it in a way that I capture that a little bit better is a good thing uh, that's influenced my, my photography. Even if I did, when I go out and maybe do some urban or street photography, I end up doing more simple photographs than uh, a congested street corner. Even though I find that fascinating, but I will probably focus a little bit different on an oddity on a building or something that, and put it in a more minimalist format of composition, I guess. Yeah, it's interesting. I've, I found myself gravitating more and more over the last four or five years to simpler, more minimalistic scenes that are just, you know, you're distilling down the essence of the subject. You're trying to exclude as much extraneous detail as possible in order to just really tell the viewer, like, this is what I noticed. This is why I like it. This is yeah. what I want to say with it. Um, and I personally find that makes it so much easier for, you know, con con you know, using composition, conveying the idea and really just hitting home what you're trying to do with the image. I've, early on, I was, you know, wide angle everything and there's so many things going on and it's like, what's this photo about? And now it's, for me, I'm just much more able to portray them to the viewer in a way that makes sense, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, same. And I, I go back and forth about my lens choices as well. Do I go to um, intimate, and use a longer telephoto and to go more intimate or getting closer type p and subjects. So I'll do some of that, but then at the same time, I do use a wide angle lens fairly often, and but I, I compose it differently and I might be drawn in to one aspect of it or a timing of the large grandiose landscape. I might be drawn in differently and so I'll it will come out like I love fog as I think a lot of photographer landscape photographers might like fog as well, but that can simplify on a grand, you know, if you have a wide angle that can also simplify it down and it's, it's just, or 
snow can do the same, etc. So right, yeah. So I enjoy the wide angles, uh, but I also I use all my lenses. I think. Oh, for sure. So. Um, it's just uh, easier to convey a message when you simplify the composition, which can yeah. be done with a wide angle lens too. Yeah. Yeah. So shifting a little bit, how has your perception of your personal well-being shifted since you made some of these connections between nature and health? It's helped on a, it shifted on, well, a big shift was doing the RV life and <laughs> big shift was just going full time, living out in nature and that reinforced it. So we thought that might be one year we're going on to the fourth year. Um, we already know if we do find a house, we're not going to get rid of the camper. We're going to may, may get a smaller one, but we're going to continue that, incorporating that in. We do know then that place we're looking for, our ideal place is going to be in nature, have space around it, have acreage as opposed to yard or feet around it. So we can actually incorporate that into it. It's rethinking about some foods and things we eat and uh, those aspects of our diet. When I say we, it's my wife and I, so we both buy into this and that, that component of it. We just know that it, when we get stressed, we go out walking and we just get outdoors and even if it's a neighborhood park. Um, so all of those things we, we didn't appreciate as much before. We might've incorporated them, but now we appreciate a lot more and we're a little bit more present when we're out there than we were before. It wasn't rush through a hike and get it done. It was, okay, walk through the, walk through the woods or walk through the, the trails and observe and notice and maybe stop a little bit more often. Seeing things like, you know, the old ad, what's the old cliche, uh, stop to smell the roses. So here we might be stop to look at the pine needles or stop to look at the dandelion or whatever it is, or that wheat stock. Yeah. And of course, photography is such a great way to kind of force yourself to do that because you start yeah. seeing the world so much differently. And then, and it also has changed where it's put the camera down and yeah. enjoy it. I mean, I, I'm a big follower of Guy Tall and, you know, he'll a lot of times will just say, yeah, I don't take my camera. I'll just be there and I'll just enjoy that nature. And like, okay, right. I don't have to capture it. I'm not going to miss out. On, I can, I can relish that, that sunrise or that sunset or that wind whispering through a willow tree. Um, and now I can, now I can write some words around it and then I can relive it and, and share it. That's awesome. Yeah. I just finished a two seven day long workshops in Yellowstone. And then the very last night, which was two days ago, uh, we went up to this huge overlook that overlooked the, the valley where Gardner, Gardner, Wyoming is, or Mon yeah. I guess it's in Montana. Anyway, when we had this incredible sunset that was like 360 degrees and we're all just photographing away and, and I stopped everyone. I said, everyone just step away from your camera and just look around and appreciate this moment. This is incredible. You know, like just take this in because it's, it really is special. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll, we'll do a similar. My wife and I, she'll, she definitely comes out with me on nighttime and we'll just take, we'll just have our time. Well, I'll be set up and I'll we'll do the some pictures and she'll put, uh, if it's nice weather, we'll put a spread down on the ground. She'll have the cheese and crackers and wine and then I'll take some pictures. And then after kind of the glorious moments or passing that, we'll just sit and we'll just be there looking at at the environment, enjoying our time together and just sitting there. So it's, it's incredible. Yeah. yeah nice. Yeah. All right. Well, I had one more topic that I wanted to okay. discuss with you today. Um, and you'd mentioned a little bit about this early on in the conversation about the role of collaboration and, and how that's benefited you. I have a Personally, I have a very strong interest in collaborating with others and especially I have like a, I have some ideas about trying to maybe like work with photographers that aren't even into nature and landscape and like send each other raw files and just see how we 
process it just to learn from each other. But what are some of the ways that you've collaborated with others um, to create art or to improve your process of creating art? It's a really, I really enjoyed this aspect of uh, what I've come upon. I'm going to split collaboration into two parts. So one is I have, I'm part of a group of like 10 or 12 photographers in the South Florida area. And we kind of, we collaborate more around support and less critiquing, but support and ideas. Cause we, as I mentioned earlier, they come from different disciplines or genre of photography. So it's more about collaborating ideas and seeing what's possible to do that. And we now meet mon mostly monthly, maybe every six weeks over Zoom and, and get together from, and we spread out, not everybody's down here anymore. The other collaboration, which is actually collaborating, creating new artwork. So in about 2016 or so, I was back up in North Dakota and I was with friends and I saw this amazing painting on the, it was a dinner party and it was on the person's house on the wall. And I'm like, gosh, this is incredible. It was abstract. It was very vibrant. It was colorful. Uh, it was just all over. And it just like, just shouting at me and I'm like, oh, well, that's amazing. Well, the owner of the house, she goes, oh, that's Jessica. And she's here right now. She's the artist. So I met this young woman who's, she's in her thirties and she's, this abstract painter and that's what she does. So we just started clicking and talking and they're like, oh, we should do something. And she threw it up, oh, we should do something. I'm like, I, I could not think about how to do that at all. And so about two years went by, we kind of talked and off and on on the phone and texting. And she said, well, what about if I paint on one of your images? And so I'm like, okay. Is it her image, my image? Does it <laughs> right. devalue my image? And 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 and, and that. So we thought about it. And I like what the heck? Let's just try something. So I said, okay, what do we want to? What do you want me to print on? And what would you do it with? And she is big oil painter, and she does large scales, like six feet by six feet or ten feet by ten feet canvases, and and she's like almost like. A, uh, Pollock where she's like throwing paint around and doing stuff and and I'm just this quiet simple uh, type uh, landscape <laughs> photographer so we we decided we would test different things so I printed some metal pieces shipped it to her I printed on some really nice fine art uh, paper which is my favorite which is a uh, Han Mueller's William Turner it's a matte paper with high texture and she could do some pastels on it. And then she had these, they're not like, they're sort of like shadow boxes. They were 16 inches square and they were probably about eight inches deep. And she was gonna use that in the past where she had painted on a small canvas and put it on the inside and then put glass over it. So we thought about what if I print on the glass and I have an image, so now I have to, it's not a full image where it's solid. I had to make it very minimalist. And uh, so we found a printer that could do a UV printing on glass. And then we had to print on the backside so, so it wouldn't scrape off. So I had to reverse the image. So I did down to basically you blow it out. So the highlights go to, uh, what is it? 256 or whatever and it becomes. So then it, the glass is clear and I did them on monotone. So I did some on black and we tried with different colors, green, brown, etc. And we put that on over her piece. So some, she had some pieces already painted and I was like, oh, this piece would work really well with this image. And so we see if that would work in it. And another one is I did, I did the image on the glass and then she painted something and put it underneath. So that was one one approach we did uh, the pastel i had done some intentional camera motion photos of a pond in scotland and they were very abstract and so she painted on those those sold really well then we did different sizes and now now we're working on one for the next show i have this portrait of a horse i took in north dakota and so I sent her 
four versions and so she's been painting on that and we'll put them up and then i'll have my piece separate as well as a huh. kind of a kind of a collection interesting and i'm working with another artist where i told her she's a watercolor painter and i said okay she had i've got a christmas card from her and i loved it it was a very nice landscape that she had done and it's like oh this is beautiful why don't you do a spring ver something springy a landscape and then get it to me in time and i'll work on writing some poem around it and we'll put that in the show as well so it's it's a poetry that goes with her image and i've done that on on uh in vero i have a group of artists that we connect with and they have some images and then i've just been moved by them so i write i'll write something and post it in the comment and then they some of them have taken them and added it to it and you know give me credit on that piece of it then i'm working with another artist she's i'd say a minimalist landscape photographer more clouds and mountains so we're going to talk tomorrow about her creating a painting based on a poem so so i'll try to interview her maybe hopefully be able to write something and then give it to her and then see what she paints from it because she's going to have a show and maybe that could go in her show then uh, the two of them that's awesome so. so i mean if someone else is looking to collaborate like that what what do you think the best approach would be in terms of trying to forge those relationships just be bold or... <laughs> um, yeah don't don't worry about don't hold on to your piece as sacred Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, for, <laughs> and be able to allow it to be morphed into something different, and it may be equally as good or better or something like that, and just experiment. And then learn, meet people in other artistic disciplines, and learn about them and themselves and and their art and their passions and. Like I spent a lot of time with Jessica in her studio. She had never let anybody in her studio before. And so she, I said, well, I got to I got to better understand because it'll help me figure out what images might go or how maybe we could work together. And so so I went to her studio. I visited North Dakota a lot of time because she's from up there as well. And then one time we went down to her where she grew up as a as a kid along the Missouri River. And so I started doing some uh, motion photos of the river in the fall time. And that ended up being a seed to some images as well that she worked on because it touched her heart. So I went to where she was had fond memories, passions, and I could see some images, some compositions that possible could work. And they did. So, so I'd be open to meet other artists, be willing to offer up your babies and see what happens. That would be cool to find out if something could happen with a sculpture or really. writing's easy. I sort of done that myself, but I could do that with other writers and that piece. And that's been done probably lots. Um, I'd love to figure out how to do it with another photographer, but I'm not really sure, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's uh, multi exposure, but oh. two cameras, two different locations or something, maybe you and I, or somewhere where you like let's overlay them and it's like see what that comes up as a as a, a multi-exposure that's, that's a fun idea yeah. yeah that's a really good idea well nice that gives a i feel like that gives everyone a lot to chew on right there because i think there's a lot of possibilities that can come out of that and i think i've always felt like the more that you can collaborate with others and you, you're going to become a better person you're going to become a better photographer you're going to start seeing the world a little bit differently. You can incorporate how other people see the world into yeah. the way you see the world. So I think it's a great way of just growing as a person and as an artist. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, most most artistic disciplines are are teams, like music. Right. You, know, you have yeah, an right, individual, right, right. but you have a lot of musicians work together, right? Um, so we can tend to maybe in photography, we tend to just focus solo from a creation standpoint than maybe doing something collaboratively together. Yeah. All right. Well, my last question, who do you recommend for the podcast? Who are some folks that we should learn more about? Okay. So one, 
a uh, couple of them, uh, this woman, she doesn't get as much credit as she deserves right now. Her name is uh, Janine Hennebury. So she is out doing landscape photography, incredibly amazing. Uh, I met her in Death Valley, December 2020. She's a very accomplished photographer, but most people have, you would have seen all of her work before if you were a golfer. And her and her brother have done golf courses around the world. Pebble Beach, they're one of the only few that get to photograph Pebble Beach, <laughs> and they've been doing it for many years. And so mm -hmm. she started stepping out more into landscape. She is incredible. She's a very hardworking photographer. She's a very nature. She has a very Buddhist mentality for being in nature and respecting it. And she does these incredible photos. She lugs around a phase one and, uh, and an icon and she just, she does amazing work. So Janine Hennebury is definitely one. There is a, there's a guy I just ran into recently and I've actually physically met him. His name is uh, Michael Scanling. He's out of San Francisco and he does these really incredible, super minimalist horizon lines, I'll call it. I mean, he's, mm. he's able to find just a very simple, beautiful piece of art and magic out of horizons, whether it's clouds and um, he lives in the Bay Area. So he's got some phenomenal stuff from there. Another woman out of Belgium that I've met only online is Marlene Van Ho, and she's a very minimalist and really, really good minimalist stuff. It makes me think a lot of Michael Kennan type work. And oh, oh. so I, I learn something from her images when I look at them as well. Then um, Sherry Mabby, she does a lot of infrared and landscape. She's actually an artist in resident in Denver right now, and she's from Colorado. Okay. Uh, so I've only met her also via online, but super intrigued by her approach. I'm not into infrared, infrared photography, but I get really drawn to hers a lot. Uh, um, some of my colleagues are in infrared, so I kind of understand the nuances of it, but uh, I like hers a lot. And then one guy that I've also been following is uh, David Henley. So he does a lot of, uh, I like his black and whites a lot. And I think he deserves a lot of credit. And many of them don't have a lot of followers. And I think they should. And not, not just to follow, follow, but they do amazing work. And mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of unsung heroes out there in the photography world. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things I love about doing this podcast is I get introduced to yeah. all of these amazing photographers that no one's ever heard of before. So, um, so that's great. Thank you so much, Kent. And this has been a really fun conversation. And like I said, we're going to do another bonus episode for Patreon for kind of your transition to becoming a full-time photographer. But uh, just thank you so much for your time. And how can people learn more about uh, your books? Uh well, first, I want to thank you for having me on and, and for doing this for ar artists of all different types and, and backgrounds in that. I think that's a great service you're doing to the community and, and the world. So thank you. Uh, my books, the easiest way is get them on my website. So it's uh, kjbimages.com. And so the two are out there and that's where I'll kind of post them. They're off through Amazon, but it actually comes through me and um, you'd be better off coming through my website than and going through Amazon, so. Right. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks again, Kent, and looking forward to our bonus chat. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you to Kent for the great chat today on the episode. I really love what you're doing, and I appreciate you sharing your thoughts with the world on the show. I'd love to hear from listeners about this episode. After listening, what thoughts or ideas do you have for collaboration with other artists? Just head over to patreon.com forward slash fstop and listen to join in on the conversation. It's open to everyone, even if you're not a member. Cheers. Okay, that's all for now. Thanks for stopping in, collaborating with us, and listening. See you next week.